I'd never come across anything like it before. I mean, what would it take for someone to want to do that? I sensed it was going to be an odd one as soon as the call came in. We'd been away, me and Sal, for the weekend. Ach Melvich, on the coast of Assent. Beautiful it was. The beach, the cliffs, the sea. Almost took your breath away, it did. And we were heading back to Edinburgh, but thought we'd pop into the bone caves on the way. We had a bit of an argument, actually. Out of breath, are we? Wonder why that is. Oh, come Look, on, Sal. If you want to spend the whole weekend inside doing F all, sorry, wide thinking, then that's fine. I'm very happy to spend a lovely romantic weekend away with you by myself. The deal is, us staying there is... Smoke a load of weed and get shit-faced all weekend. It's just... What? You, nobody, understands me. Fuck's sake. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Inspector Gavin Blackwood, on secondment from the Strathclyde Constabulary. So, a male, middle-aged, found at the Bone Caves in Schnadamf, about 25 miles north of Ullapool, on the A837, and then a couple of miles into the hills. Bloody inconvenient, I thought at first, excuse my French. Then I hoped it was a mistake, but it wasn't. Wasn't at all. I stopped. I let Johnny go ahead. Because, well, I thought I'd seen something. A moss, trotula precips, which is a notable rare crevice calico. Um, it grows in pockets of calcium-rich soil. Anyway, it wasn't. Johnny had gone way ahead. He got to the caves first. White European. Could have been late 40s, early to mid 50s. Not wearing anything out of the ordinary. Shoes, not walking boots. Trousers, chinos. Not Gore-Tex or anything like that. He wasn't underdressed. It had been a pretty dry September. No signs of a scuffle, no external injuries, nothing. Nothing to suggest he wasn't simply a day trip or tourist that had walked a couple of miles to the caves. Then just did a wee lie down and didn't get up again. I remember Johnny standing at the cave entrance, holding his hand up, stopping me. He just said, shh. It was so quiet, still I remember, though, water dripping, drip, 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 every few seconds, maddening. Two walkers found him, both students, early mid-twenties. Jonathan Ingalls, he was doing um, a Masters in Engineering on Titanium Rivets, I believe, at Glasgow Uni. And his friend, girlfriend Sally Wright, was doing a doctorate at Edinburgh Napier on something botanical. They'd been up for the weekend, staying, I believe, in Achmelvich, and were travelling back on the Monday morning. They'd gone for what they thought was going to be a quick walk to the caves before heading on south. Quick. From the car park, two miles there, two miles back. But quick for them, youngsters. He, Jonathan was the one who found him first. I thought the guy was... I thought at first the guy was asleep. He was lying on his back, feet slightly apart. His hands were crossed over his chest like some sort of statue that you'd see in a church or something. He looked so peaceful, reposed. He'd been dead, according to the pathologist, probably around 14 hours, which would make the time of death no later than 8pm, or thereabouts, on the Sunday 22nd. We could rule out a heart attack stroke very quickly. The body was well ordered, positioned. He had nothing on him to identify him, no phone, money, cards, ID, nothing. 
All we found was a train ticket, and that was it. It was as if he had made a determined effort to remain completely anonymous. Or someone else had. Even the labels from his clothes had been removed. Every single one. Johnny turned to me. Then, really fiercely, he said, Shush, can't you? Not so loud. The pickup was a bit strange, true enough, but not overly so. I was at Garve Station to meet him off the 1433 Inverness train. That's a new one on me. I mean, who wants to go off at Garve? Hmm. Eh, uh, I don't know much else. I'm just a cabbie. Janice took the call and she can't remember anything about it, she says. It gave me directions on a printed sheet of paper. No, I don't. The police guys have it. It was just a map, though. A black and white photocopy. Didn't speak. Not at all. Just pointed to an X in it. Inkin' a damn fatale. He sat in the back. No conversation. I tried, as you do. It's a good hour or so's drive, but nothing. Not a peep. I put on sports sound till the Radio Scotland reception cut over it. Ockleish in. Anguish in, I call it. And then... Fair. Was a hundred and twenty-five quid. Cash. Of course. Don't accept nothing else. Tell me any cabbie that would. Oh, well, Uber aren't proper cabbies, and they don't exist up here in the real world. He gave me a hundred and forty-seven spanking new English twenties from a roll of notes, a thick roll. So there I was, just me and him, in that cave for two hours. So, Jonathan stayed in the cave with the body while Sally went further up the hill and walked around and then back towards the car park until she managed to pick up a phone signal. The call came in at 10.32. I was in Ullapool at the Royal about a licensing issue and got to the cave's car park around 30 minutes later where I met her. She led me to the deceased. Boy, could she walk, even up that hill. We finally got to the scene at 12.09. My immediate impression? The guy looked asleep, though was in a slightly awkward position. But the thing that struck me most was his hat. If the circumstances hadn't been so serious, I'd have laughed out loud. That hat! <laughs> I saw a photo. One that... Johnny, no, Sal had taken. She deleted it. The fuzzballs told her she had to. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> that hat, though. <laughs> Just seems so... <laughs> Real stoner's hat. <laughs> no, it wasn't wearing a hat when I gave him the ride. What was that all about? A bowler hat, wasn't it? I heard it been nailed to his head, and the rim had been used as a frisbee in the top of Ben Nevis. Me? I'm, I'm Rat, friend of Johnny's. That's right, just Rat. I changed my name by Deedpole. The body where Johnny and Sal were staying, it's mine. Well, my dad's actually. Johnny's doing me a favour by doing it up. And I'm doing a favour to him. Win-win. Let me dispel all the silly rumours. The hat, we later discovered, was glued to his head. Not nailed, not stapled, not anything else. Just glued. Just. The rim we never found, despite some possible reports of it being seen on Ben Nevis and Kilda Loch Ness. The most plausible sighting, as in those claiming to have seen it were the most credible, was at Stack Polly. That's an iconic local mountain. It was near the car park, hanging on a fence post. 
A group of walkers saw it, apparently, and left it alone. They thought it was there for a reason. Perhaps it was. Anyway, later when I went, it had gone. But how did it get there in the first place? By him? How? Surely not. Why not, Stark Polly? It's a touristy bitch of postcard hill. Only, what, a few miles as the crow, sorry, frisbee flies. Maybe a stag had hooked it on its antlers and taken it. Then sort of scratched its cell in the fence post and unhooked it. I don't know. The whole situation's bizarre. Really comical. Sorry, I know someone's died, but you can't help see the funny side. Yeah, he must have been playing around with us, mustn't he? Orange silk underpants, I heard. No, 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 that's absolutely bollocks, sorry, utter nonsense. A bowler hat, yes, but there is absolutely nothing in the rumours that this guy had anything orange on him. Orange underwear, orange sash, I love Ian Paisley, tattooed in his buttocks. None of that, not at all. This was not in any way sectarian. I'm pretty much absolutely convinced of that. Well, it did form part of our initial inquiries, of course, but there were stranger elements that took prominence. Bizarre, actually. For two hours, I just sat there with the guy. I didn't move anything. I just sat and looked and... and put my hand around his, held it, stroked it. When someone, anyone, dies in Scotland, they can't be buried or cremated until a doctor completes a death certificate. That took some time. In the case of this deceased, we knew the estimated time of his death. We possibly knew the place of his death, the cave, though the cause, hmm. They didn't have a scooby dooby doo about how he snuffed it. <laughs> the cause of death was unknown and unexplained, initially at least. Hmm, yes, this case is highly unusual. I've not come across a case like it ever. Sorry, I'm with the Crown Prosecution and Procurator Fiscal Service. You get the feeling behind all that staid and upstanding bureaucratic demeanour, that the fiscal loved it. It sure trumps a bog-standard car crash or a juicy knifing or a... a coke-induced heart attack in a brothel, don't it? But there is due process, which must naturally be followed. We cops are legally responsible for the body until a death certificate can be issued. Due process, due process. <laughs> repeating everything each of them says. I said, repeating everything each of them. There is an investigative procedure to follow for a clinically unexplained death. This one too was a suspicious death, of course. We, of course, passed this case over to the police service to gather evidence. We had to wait for the conclusion of their investigation. The plain clothes came and did their thing for a bit. Sokos came out with them and did their stuff as well. Then guess who had to arrange to get the body out of the cave and off the hill? I thought at first I'd have to get a helicopter. I'd love to see a scent from the air. It'd be like flying over a, a moonscape pitted with craters and cracks and holes. I've really grown to love this area, the difference between Drumchapel and here. Well, but the mountain rescue carried them out in the end. Christ, they're fast. Like the SAS on ketamine and iron brew they were. And Muggins here had to supervise them all the time. I know every bloody inch of that hill now, every rock, every sheep turd. I sat on my coat, next to him, but nearer the entrance. But I couldn't stop looking at him. I 
cold, damp, dark spot to lie, alive or dead, arms crossed over his chest like a saint, his hat a halo, almost. There was no sign of foul play, but there was something mysterious. Why get that Allerdale ticket knowing he was getting out at Garvey for a pre-booked taxi? A return suggests he was coming back, or does it? Did someone else use the return? No ticket has been recovered from the automatic barriers at Inverness, but that doesn't necessarily mean it hasn't been used. The photocopied maps also suggest premeditation, and we looked at the paper and possible copy shops and ink and kind of pen used, but no leads there. We got forensics to give the taxi cab a thorough look over, and the room he had at the Inchnadam Fatel. The banknotes he used too, but nothing. Actually, it largely raised more questions than answers. Whilst we were waiting for the post-mortem, we were getting nowhere and fast. Who's asking? Best just to say I'm the Inchnadam Hotel manager. No. He hadn't booked, and he just turned up in Bobby's taxi around four-ish. He gave me a printed piece of paper with a sentence printed on it. Something like, I would very much like a room for one night, please. No, that's not overly strange. I tell you, we get a lot of people who don't speak English. Loads and loads off the North Coast 500. Most are a lot stranger than him. I just thought he'd come really prepared as someone who didn't have English as his first language. Actually, I did the same thing in a Czech railway station back in the 80s when I was interrailing, giving the ticket seller a scribbled note I'd copied from a phrase book at... Uh, uh, sorry. 